Hey there everyone and welcome back for more biotechnology. So this chapter is going to be all about developing some necessary skills in order to work in any kind of biotechnology or academic lab workplace. So most of what we're going to be talking about is making measurements and doing unit conversions and basically dealing with very, very, very small numbers and the instruments that go with it. So let's go ahead and start talking about it. In this section, we're going to focus on measuring volumes. So before we go any further, you need to know that it is going to be a necessary skill for you to develop to have a good level of mastery over the metric system. So the metric system is something that every scientist uses. So if you're not familiar with it, you're definitely going to want to invest some time in getting familiar with it. So basically the metric system works in units of 10. Every unit has an abbreviation that indicates to what degree to the 10th power that unit is multiplied by. So for example, if you wanted to measure mass or volume, you're dealing in specific units like grams and liters. Grams referring to mass and liters referring to volume. So it's all fine and well to have one or two or 10 or 50 grams or one or two or 50 milliliters, but what if you have something much greater than that or much smaller than that? What if you're dealing with 0 0.00005 grams? Or what if you're dealing with 10 million liters? It's not always convenient to write those numbers out to that extent. So to that end, we have these prefixes that allow you to represent those as more manageable numbers as long as you understand what the prefix means. So the most common prefixes that you're going to come across are listed here. The lowercase k refers to a kilo, the lowercase d refers to deci, lowercase c to centi, lowercase m to milli, and so on and so forth. So for example, a kilogram, which you can see over here on the far right, the lowercase k, the kilo, means times 10 to the third, or times 1,000. So a kilogram would represent 1,000 grams. The kilo prefixed to grams means you've got 1,000 of it. So if you had five kilograms, you would have 5,000 grams, and so on and so forth. Milli means 10 to the minus three. So if you've got uh, 10 milliliters, you, or excuse me, if you've got one milliliter, you're dealing with one thousandth of a liter. So it would take 1,000 milliliters to equal a liter. So this is going to involve decimal places being moved either to the right or to the left. So if you have a prefix that has a value that has a positive exponent like kilo does here, you're going to move that decimal place to the right. Everything else that is listed here is a exponent that is negative, meaning you're going to move the decimal place to the left. So deci, centi, milli, and so on are all going to be prefixes that you will use when you're dealing with very small amounts, whether it's mass or volume. So definitely I recommend getting yourself familiar with the metric system here. Like I said, very small or very big numbers can very easily be written by using some of the prefixes shown in the table above, and we will get some practice with this as we go along. And like I said, most importantly, the metric system operates in units of 10 with prefixes changing every time 10 is multiplied or divided. So your most common measurements that you're going to be making in a laboratory setting are in mass and volume. So mass, as we said, is measured in the SI, standard SI unit of grams or kilograms. Kilograms, of course, being a larger unit than grams. Volume is measured in the SI unit of liters. So again, prefixes are going to be useful to us when we're talking about very big or very small amounts of mass or volume. So mass is going to be usually measured by a analytical balance or some other type of scale. So in this picture, you can see someone weighing out a particular amount that they desire of a particular solid. They're using this little plastic weigh boat to contain the solid that they're measuring out. And the analytical balance is there to allow us to know how many grams or how many milligrams of substance are being weighed out currently. Volumes are typically dispensed by a number of different ways, but in this picture you are seeing a serological pipette of the 50 milliliter variety. This uh, scientist or operator here can pull a certain volume of liquid into the pipette using this motorized pump, and then with another button they can dispense a certain volume of liquid into another container. 
So our focus, as we said before, is going to be on volume measurements in this particular section. So what I want us to do first is I want us to get some practice on volume unit conversions. When you go into and out of the metric system, unit conversions are often going to be necessary. So let's answer this question right here. How many milliliters, milli meaning 10 to the negative third, how many milliliters are in a quart of milk? So in order to answer a question like this, we're going to need at least one conversion factor. Now what's a conversion factor? A conversion factor is a fraction that has a value of one. So because of that, it can be freely multiplied and divided by any number or any figure without changing its value. The only thing that's going to change are the units as we are going to see. The purpose of a conversion factor is that it allows us to transform one unit into another. So if we want to go from quarts to milliliters or milliliters to quart, we only need multiply by the correct conversion factor. So the information that we need here is what is the conversion factor? How many liters are in one quart? Here's your answer. One liter is equivalent to 1.05669 quarts. So this piece of information is going to be necessary for us to proceed in answer, answering the question. So now that we can move ahead with this as our conversion factor, we know that we have one quart of milk and we know that 1.05669 quarts are equivalent to a liter. So the, the workflow that we're going to use here is what is called dimensional analysis. It is the way I recommend for working through problems like this and it's going to allow us to keep track of our units along the way. So we know that we have one quart of milk and what we want to know is how many milliliters are there. So I recommend just starting by writing out what you got, one quart. So next let's multiply by our conversion factor which we said is a fraction that equals one. This fraction equals one because we know that the conversion factor says one liter and 1.05669 quarts are the exact same volume. So this is truly a fraction that equals one. What we want to do here to actually make the unit conversion work is we want to have quarts in the denominator of this fraction. You'll notice the one quart here only has a numerator and the quart is in the numerator. So we have quart in the numerator over here and quarts in the denominator over here. This is useful to us because it allows those uh, units to cancel each other out. Having the same units in the numerator and denominator means those units will cancel each other out and whatever unit is left in the numerator or denominator are the remaining units that we have to work with. In this case, liter is the only unit that is left, meaning whatever the result of this division is going to be, it will be in units of liters. So if we finish the division here, one divided by 1.05669, we end up with an answer of 0.94635 liters. Well, that's not quite the answer that we were looking for, but we are about halfway there. If you will reread the text in red, we want to know how many milliliters are in a quart of milk. We need one more conversion factor. We need to know how many milliliters are in a liter, which is what we've got. Well, the unit conversion here, the conversion factor here, is that 1,000 milliliters is the same as one liter. So once again, we are multiplying by one. We are not changing the value of the volume that we are dealing with, we are only changing the units. And you'll notice we have oriented this fraction such that liter is now in the denominator, canceling those units out, assuring that whatever answer we get now is going to have a unit of milliliters, which is what we want. So if we do this multiplication, we end up with 946.35 milliliters, the answer that we were looking for. If you want to quickly check your work, you'll notice here, zoomed in on a quart of milk, it is also listed as 946 milliliters. So good enough on our end. So one thing to keep in mind as you do dimensional analyses like this is that you are permitted to multiply or divide by conversion factors as many times as it is necessary to obtain the units that you need. You just need to make sure that you're not making any errors with your math and you need to make sure that the units all work out. So now let's talk about some tools for measuring volume. We mentioned that we showed a picture of a serological pipette, but that's certainly not the only way that you can do it. 
So which of the following tools you choose to use is very much going to depend on what volume of liquid or solution you're planning to work with. Certain tools will be good for very large volumes and certain tools will be good for very small volumes. Graduated cylinders are going to be most suited for larger volumes, usually between 10 milliliters and a whole liter, which again is 1,000 milliliters. In this picture, you can see graduated cylinders that are equipped to carry 500 milliliters, 100 milliliters, and on the far right, it's a little hard to see, but it looks like maybe uh, 50 milliliters or maybe a little bit smaller than that. I can't quite tell. Uh, maybe 10. It's, again, it's hard to tell. Serological pipettes are going to be better for dispensing volumes that are slightly less than what you would find in a graduated cylinder, usually somewhere between 2 and 50 milliliters. The one on the far left here is for uh, 25 milliliters. The one next to it is for 10. The one next to it is for 5. And then the next one it looks like is for 1, it looks like. 1 to 2. And then finally, for very, very small volumes, you are going to be looking at the lifeblood of a laboratory worker, the micro pipette. This is going to be your most indispensable tool as you work throughout the laboratory because you will very often be dispensing volumes between half a microliter and one milliliter. Anything between those, you're going to want to have a micro pipette to work with, and we will talk about those a little later. First, let's talk about the graduated cylinder. Graduated cylinder are, cylinders are made of either glass or plastic, and the, as the name implies, they list graduations on the side. These graduations tell you what fractions of a milliliter that you are working with, and the value of the graduations will vary from cylinder to cylinder depending on what sort of volume you are measuring. So in the case of this 10 milliliter cylinder, the small T tiny tick marks, those graduations are one-tenth of a milliliter, and the larger ones that are halfway in between the uh, biggest ones are going to be half a milliliter. So when you are reading the volume in a graduated cylinder, this is done by finding the bottom level of the meniscus at eye level. So what the heck is a meniscus? The meniscus is the bottom level of the volume being measured if you're dealing with water, because of the surface tension of water and its cohesive and adhesive properties, the, uh, the top part of the volume will appear to be kind of concave in shape. The meniscus is that concave shape, and you are going to read the very bottom of it. So where, whichever uh, graduation it is level with, that is the volume that you are dealing with. And we will get practice with that as we go throughout the semester. One thing to be aware of with cylinders is that they have kind of a high error rate, so somewhere between 0.5 and 1%. That doesn't seem so bad, and it is not bad as long as you are dealing with large, fairly large volumes. So for example, if you are measuring out 1,000 milliliters, you could be anywhere between 999 milliliters to 1,001 milliliters. So you need to be a little bit careful for larger volumes like that. Being off by a milliliter isn't the end of the world, but for very small volumes, that can be pretty catastrophic if you're off by 1%. Serological pipettes are often shipped in sterile packaging, so you can see some of this packaging down here in the bottom right. So this makes serological pipettes ideal for dispensing cell culture media, which we've said before, you want to take precautions to make sure that those media don't become contaminated with bacteria or fungus. So. In order to dispense these volumes using serological pipettes, you can use a motorized pipette aid, which you can see here on the right, or you can use a manual crank to draw the liquid in and to dispense it. Either one works. My personal preference is the motorized pipette aid, but of course those have to be charged. Now, now for the fun part. Micro pipettes, as we saw before, are used to dispense extremely small volumes, anything less than one milliliter. So you'll be working with these very frequently, so it's best to go ahead and get acquainted with these right now. Generally speaking, there are three or four different types of micro pipettes that each dispense differing ranges of microliter volumes. Well, what the heck is a microliter? Well, micro was one of the prefixes in the metric system chart that we were looking at before. So let's get acquainted with what a microliter is. We already know that one liter is equivalent to 1,000 milliliters, milli meaning 10 to the minus third. 
Well, micro means 10 to the minus 6. So one milliliter is actually 1,000 microliters. There are 1,000 microliters in a milliliter. If we take this a step further, one liter is equivalent to one million microliters. So you can really get some perspective here on just how small a microliter is. So micropipettes are extremely sensitive instruments that have a lot of complex internal anatomy. So we need to really make sure that we understand how they work so that we can take very good care of them. So disposable tips are loaded onto the end of the pipette when they are ready to use. These pipette tips can be sterilized, which makes these pipettes useful for working in sterile environments. You always need to use these disposable tips because liquid should never be drawn directly into the inner workings of the pipette itself. You will ruin your pipette if you try to do that. You always have to have a tip loaded on if you are going to use it. The units display here, these three boxes that you see there, will tell you how many microliters are set to be dispensed at any given time, and this can be freely adjusted by use of a dial on the pipette, usually somewhere on the side here or on the plunger up here. You can freely adjust the number of microliters dispensed, provided that you stick to the intended range of the pipette, which we will talk about briefly. So to draw liquid into the pipette, you are going to use the plunger here. So just like any other type of pipette, no matter how simple, we are uh, relying on pressure differences to draw liquid into and out of the pipette. When you press down on this plunger, before you place the tip into the liquid that you're going to draw out, you will first press the plunger down and you'll press it down until you feel it stop. Now, if you were to continue pressing beyond that, you would be able to press a little further until you reach a second stop or second resistance. For drawing liquid into the pipette, we are going to just stop at the first resistance. So you will press down on the plunger until it stops the first time. While you are holding the plunger there, you will submerge the tip into the liquid and then allow the plunger slowly up to bring the liquid into the tip until you get back to the original position. When you are ready to fully dispense the drawn in liquid, you will depress the plunger to the first resistance and then push past to the second resistance. If you only go to the first resistance or the first stop, you will not uh, dispense the final few microliters that are left in the tip. Going down to the second stop or second resistance ensures that you get everything out. So most sets of micro pipettes will include those that dispense maximum volumes of 1,000 microliters, which we call a P1000. That generally goes between 200 and 1,000 microliters. 100 or 200 microliters, which we would call either a P100 or a P200. In the case of this P100 here, its intended range is 10 to 100 microliters. And then finally, 10 or 20 microliters. In this case, we're looking at a P10 instead of a P20. So its intended range would be anywhere between 0.5 microliters and 10 microliters. Like we said, you do not want to try to dispense a volume that is outside the intended range of that pipette. Like we also said, the pipette has an adjustable dial that allows you to choose the volume to be dispensed, accurate usually to a tenth of a microliter at least. The unit's display on each micro pipette is going to be a little bit different because of the fairly drastically different volumes that we are dispensing. Each box in the unit's display refers to a digit within the number itself. For a P1000, the top box is in the thousands digit, the next box is in the hundreds, and then the final box on the bottom is in the tens. Compare that to the P10, the top box is in the tens, the middle box is in the ones, and the bottom box is in the tenths. So you definitely are going to need practice working with these so you'll always be able to tell exactly what volume you are about to dispense. So speaking of practice, let's get some practice now. First, in this case, we are looking at a P200, meaning we can work in a working range of 20 to 200 microliters. Like I said, if you try to force the pipette to dispense a volume that is not in its intended range, you can damage the inner workings of the pipette because these things work on very sensitive springs. So don't do it. So for this P200, the top display is going to read in the hundreds digit, the bottom display in the ones, and then some pipettes will list an extra knob, uh, knob on the bottom, in this case for tenths, but 
be aware not every pipette has that. In fact, most of them do not. So for the top display, since it is in the hundreds and we know the intended range is between 20 and 200, this top box cannot read anything but 0, 1, and 2. 2 if you're uh, dispensing 200, 1 if you're dispensing anything between 100 and 199, and 0 if you're dispensing anything between 20 and 99. The middle display reads the tens digit, and this can assume all numbers between and including 0 and 9, which makes sense. The third display is for the ones digit. Similarly, it can read anything between 0 and 9. The miniature display at the bottom, which I mentioned not every pipette has, in this case will read the tenths digit. In the display shown, it is halfway between a 0 and a 1, and since each graduation is 0 0.2, that means that since we are halfway between 0 and 1, this value is assumed to be 0 0.05, since we are exactly halfway in between. This particular pipette cannot read accurately anything that is in the thousands or beyond, so it's not wise to even try to do that. It's not going to be accurate no matter how much you want it to be. So let's look at another P200 example. So I should have mentioned on the previous example, the volume here that is being dispensed is 113.05. One in the hundreds, one in the tens, three in the ones, and then 0 .05 in the tenths. So our next example, we're still working with a P200. So in this case, having a zero in the hundreds display means that we are measuring a volume that is less than 100. If it was 100 or more, the top display would read one or two. The eight in the tens display means that we are reading something in the range of 80 to 89.99, depending on what the bottom displays read. The 9 in the 1's display means we are reading somewhere between 89 and 89.99, again depending on what the miniature display at the bottom is going to tell us. Finally, the miniature tenths display at the bottom is uh, somewhere in between 3 and 2, with the indicator halfway between the 0.06 and the 0.08 graduation, which means we are adding an extra 0.07 onto the end in the hundreds. So, to read this, you would go 0, 8, 9, 89, 0.2. We are halfway between 2 and 3, so the 1s is going to be 2 something. And since we are halfway between 0.06 and 0.08, it would be 0.27. 89.27. But like I said, most pipettes don't have that miniature display at the bottom. So at best, you would be kind of guessing for what the tenths display reads down there. All right, so let's look at a P1000. So in this case, the zero in the thousands display means that we are not dispensing a thousand. We're measuring something less than that. So that thousands display cannot read anything besides zero and one. The hundreds display is reading five, which means we are reading something in the range of 500 to 599.9, depending on what the bottom displays are going to tell us. The two in the tens display means we are reading something between 520 and 529.9. Again, the miniature display will tell us. Finally, the ones display in the miniature display is between zero and one. So we are dealing with 520 point something, not quite 521, but not less than 520. The marker is halfway between the 0.4 and 0.6, so this would be 520.5 microliters. And in our final example, we are dealing with a P20, which has an intended range of 2 to 20. We have a 1 in the tens display, which tells us that we are reading something that is less than 20 microliters, but at least 10 microliters, so we are somewhere between 10 and 19.999. The two in the ones display means we are reading something in the range of 12 and 12.999. The extra five in the tenths display means we are reading something between 12.500 and 12.599. The final piece of information is in the hundredths mini display. It is between zero and one with the indicator halfway between the 0.04 and 0.06 graduation. So in this case, our measured volume is 12.505 microliters. So let's finish off this video with just a little bit of extra practice on reading these numbers. 
So let's start on the far left. We've got a P1000. It is reading 0980. You'll notice the miniature display at the bottom is right set on the mark for zero, so we shouldn't have to worry about that miniature display at all. Well, for a P1000, the top display reads the thousands digit, so since that is a zero, we should be dealing with something that is less than 100. In this case, we appear, uh, excuse me, less than 1,000, so anywhere between 200 and 999. The remaining two displays are reading 98, the 9 for 900 and the 8 for 80, so this volume would be 980 microliters. Again, the miniature display for the ones digit is reading 0, so this would be 980.0. The P200 here is reading 75 point something, so 0, 7, 5, and then you can see the miniature display down there. Okay, the 0 in the hundreds display is reading 0, so that tells us that we are measuring something less than 100, and then 75, so we've definitely got 75 point something. It's going to be 75 point 2 something because the miniature display is between 2 and 3, but we need to figure out what the graduations mean. So the graduations here appear to be each 0 0.02. So from the 2, we would count over to the left 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, and 0 0.08. The needle is halfway between 0 0.06 and 0 0.08, so this would be an extra 7, one, uh, seven hundredths. So our final volume here would be 75.27. The P20 here is reading 140 with the miniature display reading something down here, which we'll figure out here in a second. This is a P20 that has an intended range of two, probably around 2 to 20 microliters thereabouts. So the 1 indicates that is the 10s digit and the 4 is in the 1s digit, so this is 14 point something. The 0 down here is in the 10th digit, so this tells us we are reading 14.0 something. The 100th digit is something we're going to have to figure out in the miniature display. We are about halfway in between 4 and 5, so this indicates that this is probably a 0 .05 situation, or excuse me, a 0 .005 situation. So our final volume here would be 14.04 because we're between 4 and 5, and then that needle is in between, uh, uh, excuse me, 4 and 6, so this would be 14.045 microliters. And finally, the P10 has an intended range of 0.5 to 10 uh, microliters, so the zero in the ones di tens digit indicates we're dealing with something less than 10 uh, microliters. The two in the ones digit indicates that we're doing 2.77 in the uh, tenths digit. The miniature display will finish telling us what's going on here. This is going to be 2.79, and then we can figure out where the needle is. It appears to be uh, somewhere between uh, 0.0. 08 and uh, the zero over here, so this is going to be 2.799. The nine here, and then the nine here, so 2.799 right there. So I definitely recommend you getting as much practice reading volumes on a pipette as you possibly can, and that is definitely going to serve you well because you will be working with these an awful lot if you ever start working in a lab. So that is going to do it for this particular video. I thank you for your attention, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.